time for Joe, everybody. Hell yeah, hell yeah. yeah. Joe is going to be my accompanist tonight. I'm going to see how that goes. There's been no instructions. It's all improv. So, <laughs> so this sucks. It's, this sucks. It's Joe's fault, right? <laughs> Thank you guys for coming out. Some of you know me. Some of you don't. Some of you got dragged here by your significant others. I appreciate them for that. I want to introduce myself to those of you that don't know me. My name's Mark. I'm a vegetarian. You can tell. You can tell I'm a vegetarian because it was the first thing I said 30 seconds into, into a microphone. <laughs> you have to know I eat different. It's important. Uh, I don't like the way uh, people talk to me when they find out I'm a vegetarian. They talk to me different. They talk to me the way creepy dudes talk to lesbians. You know? Like, ah, I bet I could change your mind. <laughs> You just haven't tried the right meat. I'm gonna take you down to KFC where they measure food in buckets. <laughs> the skin is the best part! <laughs> That's that weird shit you carnivores say to me. The skin is the best part. <laughs> but no, I will eat my salad and remain a cuck. I'm okay with that. <laughs> I try really hard not to be a, not to be a dickhead about going to restaurants with people. I usually I can find something on the menu that I can eat without making a big deal out of it. And most restaurants have at least one dish that's like vegetarian friendly, right? There is one restaurant that is actively hostile to vegetarians though. And that's Cracker Barrel. You guys ever been to You guys ever been to Cracker Barrel? <laughs> Terrible, man. All the, the food's wet, the people are wet, the table, everything's wet. <laughs> it's fucked up. And if you go, go to Cracker Barrel, open up the menu, and then go to the sides. On the sides, there's a little blurb next to the sides, and it says, Our vegetable sides have been seasoned the old fashioned way. <laughs> <laughs> Which means the seasoning might have meat in it. If you got a problem with that, you might want to eat somewhere else. <laughs> right? It's like whoever wrote that wanted to end that sentence with the word pussy. You know, like, <laughs> want to eat somewhere else, pussy? <laughs> Take your queer shit out of here. <laughs> no, I, um, I, uh, I'm a vegetarian because I, 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 I respect people that hunt, you know, and what they do is the entire reason that I can't eat it. <laughs> it's because it's like, like hunters like go out there, they find the thing they're going to eat, they kill it themselves, they, they take it home, they skin it, they take all the meat out of it, they take all the guts out, they give it to their kid. It's like a whole process that's, that's upsetting to me. When I think about it and I imagine myself doing it, I can't do it. It makes me sick to my stomach, you know? And I, I, I live that way everywhere, you know? Like, I don't buy a pair of shoes if I don't meet the kid that made it. <laughs> like, every time I go to buy a pair of shoes, I gotta, like, fist bump a little arthritic hand. <laughs> Look him in the eye and explain to him that I spent his year's salary <laughs> on a pair of shoes that I'm gonna get rid of in six months. <laughs> I don't have the spoons for this, man. This is a <laughs> this is a weird show already. You guys, have you guys heard that phrase? I have the spoons? My therapist taught me that. That's a. <laughs> I have a therapist. That's a, <laughs> that's a, that's a phrase. It's uh, it's used for people who are very mentally ill or uh, very physically uh, disabled or have some sort of some sort of difficulty. Spoons. It's like a measurement of the amount of energy that you have throughout the day. So when you're running low on energy, you're running out of spoons. But like I grew up with a dad with a heroin problem, so running out of spoons <laughs> was a very literal issue. <laughs> Like, Dad would disappear for six hours into the bathroom, and I'd eat cereal with a fork. (laughs) 
He was six foot five. What happened? <laughs> my mom. My mom made a decision. She uh, she was pregnant. She and she had uh, a, a, just a choice to make. Julie's choice, if you will. <laughs> she, she said, "I could uh, I could have these strong German genes mixed with my strong Scandinavian genes." I can mix those all together like a like a like an like the back door of an apothecary, and I can spit out a stronger baby. Or I can smoke two packs of cigarettes every day, and maybe he'll get funny. <laughs> My mom liked cigarettes more than she liked normal sized babies. Is what I'm saying. <laughs> She loved them. She loved cigarettes, dude. She loved cigarettes so much that when I was 10 years old, she said, we're going on vacation. And she put me in her car and we drove across state lines and we went to a Denny's where you could still smoke inside. <laughs> and that was it. <laughs> we got back in the car and went home. Nice vacation, right, Mark? Yeah. <laughs> put your phone down. Jesus Christ. Guys, I'm not actually mad. Chill out. <laughs> you gonna put that in your pocket, though, right? <laughs> she likes cigarettes so much. Uh, <laughs> she likes cigarettes so much that it uh, it didn't stop her from smoking when my twin brother didn't finish. Okay. Like I came out and he didn't. Do you understand? That didn't stop her. She liked smoking so much that when the same thing happened to my little sister's twin sister, still didn't stop her. My mom treated her womb like a Spartan training ground. And I'm the alpha. It's amazing how that happens. I don't, uh, I don't mind being small. It doesn't bother me. I know it bothers you. <laughs> I know it bothers you because I went to donate sperm and they told me no. <laughs> I walked in there and the lady behind the counter, she looked up from her magazine and she went, no. I didn't even fill anything out. <laughs> I turned around and they had like one of those rulers going up the door. <laughs> didn't even have a chance. <laughs> My therapist, uh, his, his name is Brandon, he's very handsome and we're going to get married, but he, uh, he told me that I got something called body dysmorphia. Have you guys heard of that? Okay, body dysmorphia, for those of you that don't know, body dysmorphia is when you look in the mirror and no matter how good you look, you go, Doesn't matter how good you look, that's the reaction. And like, how arrogant for me to have that. Like, like I'm, I'm a man. Which, and I'm not saying that like men don't have beauty standards, but like, they really don't, do they? Like every beautiful woman I know is dating a guy who just looks like he's fucking sticky. You know what I mean? Like where's, like, okay, there's a beautiful woman right there. Look at the fucking ogre next to her. It's disgusting. And <laughs> all right, so yell at one, insult another. <laughs> I'm one of those people. I got I got a girlfriend who's way out of my fucking league. She's like she's beautiful. She makes more money than me. She's smarter than me, taller than me. She got everything that I ever wanted, and it makes me act wrong. It makes me it makes me act very different, and it's like. It, I, I don't know, it's, I just really wish that I could like meet her dad and thank him for all the damage he did. <laughs> That's what I would do, but she doesn't like, she doesn't talk to him. <laughs> makes me act weird. It makes me act weird in like very, uh, very non-traditional ways. Like I was in a store, I do that sometimes. <laughs> I was in a store and this old lady uh, was in line and I cut in front of her. 
And then she tapped me on the shoulder and she said, excuse me, young man, I was in line. And I turned around and I said, excuse you, young lady, I am the future. <laughs> if you ever want to uh, get an accurate description of your body as a man, you should just ask a gay man what the cute uh, nickname is for your body type. It's like you're not, you know, you're not like a skinny little weakling. You're a twink. It's cute, right? You're not like a big fat dude. You're a bear, you know. And I'm not like little and hairier than I should be. I'm an otter. <laughs> okay. I had somebody uh, uh, tell me that he didn't like that white kids get all this shit for school shootings. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean by that? And he said, uh, White kids shouldn't get all the flack for school shootings because the best one was an Asian kid. Of course it was. <laughs> and I was like, pause. <laughs> Let's analyze that sentence a little bit. When you say the best one, <laughs> he's like, you know the high score. I'm like, we're not going to call it that. <laughs> I'm like, and then he said he was an Asian kid, which is true, which is true. Like the most deadly school shooting in the United States history was Virginia Tech, and that was Cho Sung Wee. And uh, he killed 37 people, I think it was. That part's true, but it was, he was Asian. Of course he was. I wanted to dive in a little bit. <laughs> and I said, I said to him, I said, cut his name out. I said, <laughs> Of course he was. And he goes, Asians are good at math. You think a white kid could calculate the trajectory of all those bullets? Ugh. I was talking with my black friend. I only got one. He's not here. I don't know if you noticed. <laughs> I was talking to my black friend about, uh, about high school, and he, he mentioned this story uh, when he was in uh, 10th grade. Kid came into the classroom, popped off a couple rounds. Nobody got hurt, thankfully. Nothing happened. Nothing tragic happened. Uh, kid got arrested. Everything ended. And then he was telling me that story, and I was like, that's amazing, dude. That's incredible. You survived a school shooting. He's like, no, I didn't. No, I didn't, because this was an all-black school, and when it happens there, they don't call it a school shooting, do they? They call it gang violence. And that was really telling to me. That's a white urge, isn't it? To, to take language and bend the words around and, and make it suit us and make it hurt them. We love doing that, and we're good at it. We're good at it, and you, and you are probably involved with it, and you don't even realize it. I got a personal example. I used to live at this house, and I ended up at this house uh, because I made mistakes. I don't do that anymore. I don't make mistakes anymore. And I ended up at this house. And what was interesting about my room in this house was that I didn't have a bed. I had a blanket on the floor and I had, uh, I had a suitcase full of clothes. That's all that I had. And the door to my room didn't lock. So if I ever wanted to keep people out, I had to take the doorknob with me when I left. <laughs> and the doorknob popped out way too easy. <laughs> But that wasn't all, that was just my room in the house. The rest of the house was disgusting. All the paint was peeling off the walls, the furniture was old as hell. There were constant parties in this house. Every other night, there were just a whole parade of strangers coming in, and every single person that came in made it like it was their own. I would wake up and there would be people that I didn't know asleep in the bathtub. That happened constantly, every week. I lived there for a year and it never got better. In fact, it just got worse. As time went on, the parties got bigger, the paint peeled more, there were more and more strangers in the place, and eventually nobody had a key to the front door anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and the guy that owned this house was a drug dealer. 
Now that's a trap house. <laughs> that's a trap house. But the people that lived there, we were white. So it wasn't a trap house. It was an art collective. <laughs> we got any followers of Christ in the house? <laughs> I was tepid and nervous. So. <laughs> My, uh, my grandma had a direct line to Christ. She was very... Uh, <laughs> she would always pull me aside and she would... One time she pulled me aside and she was like, Marky, I've been praying about it and Christ is telling me that you need to end abortion. <laughs> and you know, I was eight. <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> So we went, out to, uh, we went out to a clinic to a protest, <laughs> and uh, she put the tape over my mouth and everything. It was very, very real, very surreal. And um, she comes up to me at the protest, and, and she goes, Marky, I've been praying about it, and Christ is telling me that you need to take this rock and throw it at the next woman on the way into the clinic. Yeah, it's a terrible way to find out I got a hell of an arm, right? Like, <laughs> So we went, uh, we went home. Family was uh, distraught at this, uh, at this news. They didn't like that my grandma made me do that. <laughs> grandma was proud of me. <laughs> Everybody was upset. But my dad had this little twinkle in his eye, and he pulls me aside. And he goes, you know, Mark, I've been praying about it. And Christ is telling me that you need to try out for baseball. <laughs> I have a day job because I'm not successful. Uh, <laughs> at this day job, I work with libraries. Uh, libraries are kind of interesting. We're in a very hotbed political climate right now. Book bannings came back in a big bad way, right? And it's uh, it's interesting. It's interesting. I had this. I got this one client. They had uh, a book on display that was about a turtle that had two dads. Yeah. <laughs> and then this, this guy came into the library and he pointed that book and he went, No! 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 You cannot show that to my kid! He's going to be confused and scared! How am I supposed to explain to my son who's confused and scared that turtles can have two dads? <laughs> blew my mind. <laughs> like, how do I explain to my son? My son's confused and scared. What do I do? First of all, if your kid's confused and scared, you should do the right thing and let him know that he's going to feel that way forever. <laughs> That's not going away, dog. That, it just gets worse. I'm 31 years old. I'm 31 years old. I woke up this morning and I said, I don't know how my credit score works. I was confused. Looked it up. Fucking scared. <laughs> Terrified even, what's gonna happen next? <laughs> That's a feeling that you have to be okay with. You're gonna get confused and scared and you have to lock into that feeling and you have to feel it on purpose. You have to let it happen to you. If you try to fight it, your brain's gonna go haywire and start filling in the gaps with shit that doesn't make any sense. All right, back in ancient Egypt, they saw the sun. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> they saw the sun rise every day and they were fucking terrified every single day until one day somebody came along and said guys I figured it out it's a man with a scarab for a head rolling a bowl of souls across the sky and everybody went Whew. <laughs> can you imagine if we didn't know <laughs> you have to be okay with being confused and scared I think that's where that like overzealous conspiracy brain comes from because if you ever talk to those guys who are really, really into conspiracies, they always hook you with something that kind of makes sense and kind of gets you going for a second, and then they drop the bomb on you right at the end. You know, I had a guy come up to me and he said, 
you know, human trafficking is bad. Yeah, yeah, I, I, okay, I can get behind that. I can get behind that. Human trafficking is bad because they're harvesting the blood from children to keep the Jews young. <laughs> you lost me, Dave. <laughs> you lost me, bro. Like, no, no, I've met Jews. <laughs> no, no, no. This isn't Gaza. We're, like, we're safe here. This is Ohio. <laughs> like, okay, sorry. <laughs> okay, sorry. Which side of the genocide are you guys on? <laughs> <laughs> I got a friend named Ryan, he's Jewish, and he's like my best friend. He's just little and funny. He's not a threat. He's great. I had somebody uh, uh, yell at me after I did that joke once, and he said, uh, he said, I read the Torah, and I, he said, I read the Torah, and I'm going to tell you right now, the blood sacrifice, that's circumcision that they're talking about. I was like, whoa. Well, if that keeps you young, why am I getting older? <laughs> I keep having nightmares that my foreskin comes back for revenge. <laughs> like I'll just wake up and I'll hear this noise in my closet. And I'll, I'll get up and I'll open the door. Then there's my foreskin taking a bread knife to all my hoodies. <laughs> What the fuck is I talking? Libraries, libraries, okay. So. <laughs> libraries, there's another thing going on with libraries. Have you guys heard of Drag Queen Story Hour? Okay. Excellent, all right. It's happened like three times, but they act like it's, a, it's an epidemic. But uh, one of my clients, they had somebody like actually march into the library and threaten the librarians and say, you will not have drag queens read stories to my kids. You will not have these unsafe degenerates read stories to my kids. And that was crazy because drag queens don't read as unsafe to me. Like I, maybe it's just the way that I grew up, you know, like I grew up watching Looney Tunes and my favorite character was Bugs Bunny. And you know what Bugs Bunny did in every single episode? He dressed in drag. And you know what Bugs Bunny did when he dressed in drag? He foiled the evil plots of a white man with a gun. <laughs> Which historically has been a little bit more dangerous to our kids. <laughs> All right. I've been very interested in childbirth lately. Because <laughs> I've seen I've seen like baby heads and I've seen vaginas and they just never never made sense to me, like how that worked. And I did some research. Um, did some research. Turns out that when a baby comes out, it's not done. Like the, the head in the skull is like soft, like silly putty. So it like kind of folds a little bit so it can like make its way out. But then like it takes like three months for the skull to harden. That's cr we should take advantage of that. <laughs> We're missing out on a lot of options. You could have a new kid every day. Like you could just like wake up, pop your kid on a pottery wheel, <laughs> just like stick your thumb in the top of his head, and today, my son, you are a vase. <laughs> this is probably the last time I'm ever doing this. This is fine. I was on my way over here. Uh, I was behind a car. I was in a car too. <laughs> I'm just chasing a car. <laughs> Strange behavior. Then uh, this car had one of those stick figure families on the back of it. It was a it was a mom, a dad, two kids, a baby, and a dog. And that was it was funny because like they all had guns. <laughs> but it was like the the smaller the person got, the bigger the gun. <laughs> so like dad had a pistol, but then he got down to the baby, and then the baby had an AR-15, and that. It's a good goof. You know, it, I was laughing when I saw it, and then I saw the dog. I stopped laughing. Dog wasn't holding a gun. Dog was holding a grenade. That's sad. That's, yeah, that, that game of fetch only lasts for one round. <laughs> okay, can I get political in here? All right. 
you guys seem uncomfortable. So. <laughs> I think bestiality is wrong. Okay. I think it's wrong. I don't think you should do it. I don't think you should do it. I think I, I'm gonna talk about dog fucking for the next six minutes. So. I think, <laughs> So I think the thing about fucking dogs is like, <laughs> I think it's wrong to do it because they like they can't give consent. Consent's very important to me. That's it's very wrong to fuck something that can't give you consent. Dogs can't give you consent. That being said, that being said, I have had dogs ask for my consent, and we need to talk about that. <laughs> All right, like one time I was at a friend's house and he warned me before I came over. He was like, Sheila's in heat. Didn't like that I felt like he had to warn me, but it's good to know, right? I go over there and uh, we're just hanging out, dogs being normal, and then he leaves the room and then Sheila looks back at me and she comes and stands in front of me, turns around and then shows me <laughs> her dog pussy. <laughs> And she was ready. Like, she was ready to go. Like, it was like red and stingy and hanging. Like, she could have walked down the street and erased chalk off the sidewalk. Like, she was ready to go. And I said no. <laughs> I'm a cat person. <laughs> I don't fuck my cats. I want, to, I want to make that clear. I don't fuck my cats. And I wouldn't unless I had to, but I don't. So. And if I had to pick one, Ichabod. <laughs> he's got the most meat on him. He's pretty thick about it, if you will. He's got... <laughs> You're right. Let's talk about something else. Let's. <laughs> Uh, uh, I don't know. I, people say you shouldn't kink shame. I like it. I do it. I like kink shaming a lot. I think it's fun. I, you know what? No, I don't like kink shaming. I don't think we should shame people for their kinks, but I think we should be allowed to ask why. Like, how did this, how did this happen to you? How did this become your thing? Like, okay, like, I have this event that I really regret from college when, uh, this guy found me on Craigslist. And he paid me fifty dollars to pay to like to like piss in a pair of whitey tighties, and then fold them up in a very particular way, over, over, up, and then put them into a plastic baggie, fold that over the top, no zipper, fold it over the top, and then fold it left and right like a warm wallet. <laughs> and then he had me meet him in the park at 1.30 a.m. specifically to hand it off to him. Like it was illegal. It's not illegal, it's just weird. Uh. And I regret this a lot. I, I don't regret doing it because sex work is real work, you know, and I'm a real boy. But like, <laughs> but I regret not asking him like, the piss I get. I get people, people like that. But the folding, it was so specific and it's haunted me ever since. <laughs> So much so that when I was encountered uh, with, with another kink and I saw my opportunity, I just had to ask questions. Like, okay, I'm gonna let you guys on a little story. Okay, I have this, like, I don't know if you can see it through the taco meat, but I have this scar on my chest right here. I got that from a woman. And, um, you know, she wanted, to, she wanted to cut me during sex. And, you know, she talked me into it, which you're allowed to do to men. <laughs> She said, please, and I said, okay, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and when that blade hit my skin and the blood poured out of me, her eyes rolled in the back of her head, and she let out the most orgasmic wail that I've ever heard in my life, and haven't heard since, which, that's not my fault. You know? <laughs> <laughs> And when we, were, when we were laying in bed and I was applying the back teen to my chest, I, I turned to her, I said, cut that name out too. I said, <laughs> I turned to her, I said, um, that was interesting. And she goes, you're the first one that ever let me do that. And I was like, wow. <laughs> I wonder why. <laughs> 
but I saw my opportunity and I said, you know, if it's okay, if I ask you, can you tell me, why is that a thing for you? Why do you like that? And, and she told me when she was, uh, when she was 10, 11 years old, she started masturbating for the first time. And when she was doing it in her family home, she didn't want any of her family members to, to hear anything or know that anything was going on. So what she did was she would put on VHS tapes of old horror movies. And then she just started orgasming during kill scenes in horror movies. <laughs> and it kept going that way. It kept going that way until that was the only way that she knew how to do it. She could only orgasm to death scenes in movies. And for years, she was asking men if she could do something to them to kind of come close to that experience because she, normal sex was never doing it for her because she had been conditioned in this way. And I was the first one that let her do it to me. And when she explained this to me, I was furious. I was so mad. You mean we could have just put on a fucking movie? <laughs> I have so many movies. <laughs> and now you fucked it up for both of us. You escalated it. You're gonna have to cut somebody to come for the rest of your life, or worse. And every time I make somebody come, I'm gonna get scared. I want to talk about love a little bit. Is that okay? Cool. Thanks for agreeing with me. I like. Uh, <clears throat> I like love. I have a difficult time with love. I'm not like, um, well, <laughs> I'm not well. So like love has been, you know what I mean? Difficult, right? Difficult to figure out. I sought, um, I sought advice from people who seem to have made love work for them. And I wanted them to kind of break it down for me and help me, help me understand it a bit more to see if I could apply that. Uh, in my life, and I was able to get some advice from from some of them. There was this one. I got this friend. Uh, she got divorced. That's not where the love works, right? But she got divorced, and after she got divorced, um, the first guy that she dated was in a wheelchair, and you know, we noticed. <laughs> we saw, right? We didn't do. We didn't say anything. It's fine. It's fine. They broke up. The second guy that she dated was in a wheelchair. Hmm. Okay. They broke up. It's fine. It's fine, right? And then the third guy that she dated after that divorce was in a wheelchair. They got married. And then when I went to their wedding, I waited until she had a few drinks and her at the reception before I made my move. Right? I got warmed up to her and I said, she made me promise not to use her name. I said, Jessica, <laughs> please just cut out all this. <laughs> I said, Jessica, <laughs> we're not trying to accuse you of fetishizing the disabled, <laughs> but we have all noticed <laughs> a pattern in your partners over the last couple years. Can you explain that a little bit? And she, you know, she put her arm around me and she smelled like liquor. And, and she goes, you know, Mark, when I was married, whenever we got into an argument, he would hit me. And I said, never again. Nowadays, we get in an argument, I just go upstairs. <laughs> she said, Mark, I got a motto I live by. If he can't reach you, he can't beat you. <laughs> Sometimes love is simple, right? <laughs> Sometimes love is complicated. I got, I got a cat. That's complicated. That's way more complicated. I love that cat very much. I do, but it is. It's, it's complicated. <laughs> it's so, let me explain. I, I'm a, I'm like six years sober right now. Oh, you guys, oh yeah, I am better than you. You're right. Yeah. I had to, I had to get sober. Alcohol's never the problem. The drug's never the problem, right? It's the person that's the problem. And I am that person in this story, right? Uh, there's something, whatever the mechanism is in my brain that says, that's enough, you can stop now, I don't have it. And uh, part of getting sober is not just quitting the drug, quitting the substance, 
part of getting sober is examining yourself and examining what kind of person you are. And the person you are when you're under the influence is still the person that you are. And part of that examination for myself was having to realize that the person that I am is a selfish son of a bitch who will just use people. People that love me, people that trust me, I will take them and I will use them and I will squeeze them within an inch of their life for my own selfish needs. And when you get sober and you confront yourself with that, you have to do that every single day to stay sober. You know, I went to AA and it was whatever, you know, I don't go there anymore, but their motto is one day at a time and that's exactly how it is. And one day at a time to me means that every single day I have to confront the person that I am and the person that I am hurts people on purpose. And every single day when I'm talking to myself and I'm, and I'm looking at that horrible reflection of myself and I'm examining the worst parts of me and I'm tampering them down and I'm asking them to be nice and I'm asking them to play good with me for a little bit and I'm fighting and, I, and, I, and I'm understanding that God plays favorites and I'm not one of them. As I'm going through all that, I'm tumbling down this pit and I have to make a decision every single night. I have to make the decision if I'm going to keep going with the person that I am or if I'm going to put a fucking bullet in my head. Those are my only options. Every single day I decide, do I kill myself or do I keep going? Those are my only two options. And it's right then, it's right there when I'm in that pit, when I'm in that deep, dark place, that's when my cat walks over to me. And she curls up on my lap and she goes to sleep. And when she goes to sleep, what she's telling me is that she doesn't care what I've done. She doesn't care what I'm capable of. She doesn't care what kind of person I think I am or what kind of person I've proven to be. All she cares about is what I am in this moment right here, right now. And what I am right here, right now is safe. Yeah. And I love her for that. Yeah. That being said, one time she woke me up by using my morning wood as a scratching post. <laughs> Sometimes love is complicated. <laughs> I get other cats too. I don't like the way they talk to me. <laughs> Remember that fuckable cat I talked about earlier, Ichabod? Okay, I'm talking about him right now. I'm going to complain about Ichabod right now. Because he is fuckable, but that doesn't make him a piece of, that doesn't make him not a piece of shit, right? Like, the way he talks to me is so aggro and out of line, completely out of line. Like, okay, like, he likes to, uh, he likes to sit on top of me when I'm sleeping and lick my eyes to wake me up, right? And I wondered, what's that about? And I looked it up, and it's because I've been sleeping too soundly, and he's worried that I'm dead. And he's got to make sure I'm awake so I can feed him, right? Isn't that the most adorable way I've ever gotten pink eye? <laughs> you know when a cat, uh, like, brings you a piece of food or a mouse or something, and they drop it in front of you? It's because they think that you're a bad hunter, and they're trying to show you how it's done, right? Let me tell you what Ichabod did. Ichabod went over to uh, my bedside table and he took that big fucking clown shoe paw of his, grabbed the handle, pulled the drawer all the way out, spread all the contents on the floor, dug his little nose around in there, grabbed my girlfriend's vibrator and dropped it right in front of me like, you will never make her come. <laughs> It's just like, it's really aggro for a guy who like, when I cut his nails, he's like, he's like screaming like I'm gonna send him off to Meowschwitz, you know, like. <laughs> Meowschwitz, that's Auschwitz for cats. <laughs> From uh, Pearl War II. <laughs> <laughs> Propagated by Adolf Kittler. Okay. I think that's enough of that. <laughs> Uncomfortable. <laughs> June 18th, 
2020. That day is burned into my memory. I was having sex that day. That's not, I'm not bragging. <laughs> <laughs> I was having sex that day. And here's the thing about me. I'm on a very high dose of Prozac. And uh, what that means is that it's hard for me to come. And what that means is that when I'm having sex, like that phone is turned off. Like the distractions are gone because I need to be here to do my job. Right? So on June 18th, 2020, my phone was off while I was having sex. And then when I turned my phone back on when I was done having sex, uh, I saw about a dozen missed calls from my mom. And I called her and, and she said, Marky, I was trying to get a hold of you. What were you doing? And I was like, Mom, I'm a man now. <laughs> <laughs> And she told me that uh, about 30 minutes prior, my dad had passed away. So, you know, he died while I supplied, you know what I mean? <laughs> he had a heart attack while I was up in that, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. He didn't make it, she didn't fake it, what? <laughs> he kicked the bucket! You get it. <laughs> you get it. That was June 18th, 2020. June 18th, 2023 was Father's Day. <laughs> Calendar's got a sense of humor, right? <laughs> <laughs> Took me three years to cry about my dad dying. Took me three minutes to write that joke. <laughs> good, good, good. 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 I'm very small. Good. I'm six foot seven if you adjust for inflation, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, um... My mom passed away, too, less than a year later. That was weird. That was weird. My mom, neither of my parents and I had a good relationship, right? And that's a very complicated kind of grief. But it is still grief. <laughs> You know, and there's, there's the five stages of grief, right? What are they? They're, uh, they're uh, bargaining, depression, uh, help me out. Anger. Anger, uh, denial, and then finally acceptance, right? Denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. And I think that's, that's a good list, I think. I think it could be better. <laughs> you know, I think, the, I think we need like a sixth number in there because it's like, they don't happen in order, right? It's not linear. Grief is a very nebulous, complex thing like that, and, and it's, it continues to change and it continues to evolve over time. So after you reach acceptance, then what is it that you do? And I think, I think number six should be make it weird, right? You should really, <laughs> you should really get fucking weird with it, right? Like, I don't know, I gotta, I gotta, remember that, that dog that tried to fuck me earlier? Okay, that dog's dead now. <laughs> <laughs> Spoiler alert. <laughs> And when I go over to that friend's house now, like, that dog is still there. He just taxidermed it. <laughs> he taxidermed it, and he put it up on its hind legs, and he dresses it in weird little outfits. <laughs> so every time you go over, Sheila could be a Nazi. <laughs> you never know. And my friend, he went through all those, all those stages. You know, he went through the, the denial, the anger, the bargaining, the depression, the acceptance. And then he made it weird and he made it into a much more beautiful thing. You know? When my dad died, it was sudden. When, you know, he was... I didn't talk to him for a really long time. And I didn't have the opportunity to speak to him before he died. The last thing I ever said to my dad was, go fuck yourself. And that was three, four, five years before he died, something like that. And with my mom though, even though we had that same bad relationship, she knew she was dying. We had time. And what that meant is that we had to get together and talk about it. And she, in those last couple weeks, she, she expressed uh, regret that, uh, she, you know, she knew how important this was to me, this, this comedy, my little skits, you know, she knew, how, <laughs> she knew how important comedy was to me and she'd only ever made it to two shows and at one of them, she got kicked out for getting too drunk before the show started 
And at the other one, she got kicked out for heckling me. So, <laughs> so we never really had, you know, she was never part of this, right? And she sat down and, and she was like, I, I've only got a couple weeks left and we know this. And I wanted to, I wanted to maybe do something with you. I wanted to, I wanted to write a joke with you. I wanted to be part of this with you. And, and, you know, she wasn't good at it. <laughs> but we did. We sat down, we, we wrote a bit, and uh, we came up with this idea, and this idea was this, this bit that I'm doing right now. And we had a very long, in-depth talk about those stages of grief and what that grief is going to look like after she's gone and how I'm going to handle it. And then she wanted to know how I was going to make it weird, you know? How we're going to make it weird. And we, we talked about it and she came up with this idea and she said, what you should do is you should make sure that I'm at every single show <laughs> from now until the rest of your days. For those of you in the back, I produced from my pocket <laughs> uh, a great value brand Ziploc baggie uh, containing my mother's actual ashes <laughs> because I tried it with sugar. It just didn't feel right. So. <laughs> I know she lost weight, right? <laughs> she turned me into a prop comic. <laughs> the last, last insult before she died. <laughs> and it's weird. <laughs> I get it, I know. I know it's weird, I know. But you know, like it's like, what did I say at the beginning of this, right? Like grief isn't, you know, it's, it's nebulous, right? It changes, it keeps evolving. Like even after you go through the depression, the anger, the bargaining, uh, the what, fuck, whatever, the acceptance, whatever. And then you make it weird. Even after you go through all those things, even after you go through all that, like grief doesn't just stop after you make it weird. It continues to evolve. So what's step seven? Right, what happens next? Do you like weddings? I like weddings. I like weddings. My favorite part of a wedding is when uh, you go to the reception, and at the reception, at the reception, the bride holds the bouquet and then she spins around and she. <laughs> And whoever catches it, that means they're next. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna get out of here. On, I got one more. <laughs> um, I was watching a documentary about a big, big, big dude, large man. He's over a thousand pounds, very big. And uh, he couldn't get out of bed. And uh, they kept cutting to this guy's wife in the documentary. And she was like, I just don't know what to do. I don't know how to help him. Every time he asks me for food, I bring him food. And he just keeps getting bigger. And I'm worried, like, what if I, if I don't give him food, he'll get mad. And I don't know what he's going to do if I do that. And I just wanted to pull her aside and be like, man, like, Here's what you do. You, you walk in with your tray of food. You get right out of reach. You put it on the ground and then you take two steps back. Eventually he'll get better and you're going to be perfectly safe because a wise woman once told me that if he can't reach you, <laughs> he can't beat you. That's my time, guys. Thank you.